Oh, well, over to you. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Manuel Konsam. I'm Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Liberty Global and a board member of Street Child Netherlands. Welcome to this webinar uh, today on the evolution of learning uh, during the past year. Today, we're going to discuss how digital transformation has affected education across the globe and what the private sector, governments and NGOs can learn from each other. I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker in particular, Usha Limbu, who is program manager for Street Child Nepal, as well as our panel speakers, Diane Janknecht and Georgi Dimitrov. Uh, Diane founded this AI scale of WiseNose. Georgi is responsible for the newly created uh, unit, Digital Education in the European Commission. And we're really happy to have you here with us. I'll, I'll introduce them, their bios briefly in a second. We also have an excellent moderator with us today, Melissa Ratzak partner in Deloitte's consultant technology, media and telecom team, and she is a fellow board member with me in the Street Child Netherlands board. And let me give you a quick bio. If also well, um, the moderator will show the bios on screen at the moment. So we have Melissa, who is, as I said, a partner in Deloitte's consulting technology practice. She has over 22 years of experience in leading and managing global transformational programs where technology plays a key role. And next to her client work, Melissa has joined the Deloitte's Women's Network and, uh, and as a board member, of course, of Street Child. Her purpose, her personal purpose is to equalize the workplace and ensure every girl and woman gets the opportunity to follow their dreams. And today she will be the moderator of her panel later in the session. Then we have uh, Georgie, and Georgie is responsible for the newly created unit in the European Commission, Digital Education, uh, in, the, in the Director General for Education and Culture. He joined the European Commission in 2008 and was first involved in various roles in setting up the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. He then helped to develop and launch He Innovate, uh, an initiative by the Commission and OECD aimed at supporting universities becoming more entrepreneurial. He also led the development of the Digital Education Action Plan, supported in, uh, adopted in January 2018. And before joining the European Commission, Georgie worked in a number of uh, multinational telecom com companies in Germany. And um, we're very happy, Georgie, to have you here with us. Uh, and finally, also, kind of Diane. Diane Janknecht is founder of WiseNose. Um, based on years of academic research, WiseNose gives students across the world access to an internet of education. With uh, AI technology, WiseNose matches relevant information from the internet to any curriculum, students of all ages. WiseNose has currently offices in Amsterdam, London, and Delhi in India, and aims to be nothing less but a global market leader in this area. Uh, Diane um, started this uh, venture uh, after working uh, quite a long while with, with Microsoft as, a, as an executive. Uh, and as an established businesswoman, Diane has been selected for many awards, including the 100 women founders in Europe to watch in 2019. And um, we're very happy to have you here with us today as well, Diana. And, of, um, and last but not least, uh, Usha. Usha, who leads uh, Street Child's Nepal country, uh, who is Nepal's country lead uh, for Street Child with over five years of experience in fundraising and program management. Usha works across program research, monitoring, impact study, and communication to, to help uh, Street Child's projects achieve the best outcome for the participants. She has a Bachelor in Sociology and International Development and a Master's in Development Studies. And welcome. Very happy to have you here with us, uh, Usha. So, um, to kick off, Usha uh, Limbo will show you a short video about Street Child's work in Nepal before giving a keynote speech. And thereafter, we move into a, a panel discussion, followed by a Q&A session with the opportunity for all of you to ask questions to our speakers. And um, let me now first briefly introduce you to Street Child and then and get, then give the word to, um, to, um, to Usha. Street Child, for those of you who don't know the organization yet that well, it believes every child deserves the chance to go to school and learn, wherever you born and wherever in the world. Based on a rapid assessment, Street Child managed to establish remote learning opportunities for thousands of children during the past year who have been otherwise cut off from life-saving, life-sustaining information, services and support due to school closures and lockdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's pro probably been the most 
pervasive impact of the pandemic in in children on the children of that generation was not the health impact, but it was the education impact, and that's why we're talking about it today. In this webinar, we show how low cost solutions such as recorded instructions and interactive resources can make a tremendous difference for the present and future of these children. And, and, and I'm personally very happy that we were able to, to, to um, engage in this program with Street Child, um, which is an organization that, that I've been involved with for the past 10 years now, first through Street Child, Street Child UK, uh, but increasingly now also with Street Child here in the Netherlands and other countries in Europe. So when we turn back to, um, to the, the program in Nepal, uh, Usha was part of the initiation of this program in Nepal, uh, born and raised in Nepal also, uh, completed university in London and lived in London for about 10 years before moving back to Nepal to lead Street Child's projects in 2018. And having worked on Street Child's girls' education focus program for the last three years, her main driving factor remains the opportunity to enhance learning and quality of life for some of the most underreached and marginalized girls in, in Nepal, which is always uh, something that requires uh, utmost attention. Using Street Child's work as an example and, and adding on, we aim at understanding together how the current pandemic is shaping the future of education, how we could turn the current global education crisis into business opportunities to level education across the globe. We have a full growth program, so I don't wanna hold you up any further and wanna Turn over to Usha and the video. Or is Emma turning over to Melissa? I'm, I'm my, my apologies there. I think. You're still on mute. Yes. Sorry, I think Paula, if you go into the slide deck and then Usha will pick it up from here. So Usha, you might also still be on mute. I think. Uh... I didn't realize it myself. Hi everyone, and thank you, Manimo, for that introduction. And thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, before I begin, I think we're going to show the video first. So Paula, perhaps if you could show us the video and then I can I can begin my presentation. So, Paul, if we could go back to the presentation and uh, Usha, thank you for being here and also uh, being a part of Nepal and seeing what's happened over the last year in this pandemic, I think has been traumatic uh, to all the students that you've been working with over the years. So I appreciate you being here and sharing, let's say, the impact uh, of what, let's say, digitalization is, has done also in Nepal, the opportunities that have been brought there, but also the significant impact that's been brought to these girls and other students and how everyone is trying to make it work. So uh, look forward to hearing uh, your insights and, and how you're dealing with this uh, challenge. So Paul, if you could move to the next slide, please. 
Thank you again, Melissa, and, and thank you, Paula, for the for the slides. So for those of you that don't know Street Child very well, I think Kalanyo has very helpfully given us an introduction already. Um, we are an organization that want to make sure that children learn. And we do that in some of the toughest places in Africa and South Asia. So this past year has been incredibly challenging for us as it has been for other education providers. Um, Paula, can we go on to the next slide, please? At present, there are 1.5 billion children in the world who are out of school. And what this means is that there is an entire generation of students who are at the risk of permanently disengaging from education. And so Street Child now um, more firmly than ever believes that children need to have access to education, not just um, not even in, but especially in emergencies. Um, next slide, please. So the video that you just saw, the girl in the video, her name is Kushbu, as you as you saw, and Kushbu belongs to a community called the Musaha community in Nepal. So this community is one of the most socially humiliated, politically marginalized, and economically exploited groups in the country. They are considered to be of a very low caste and even within the low so-called low caste Dalit groups they are considered to be the untouchables amongst the untouchables and because of this um, centuries of oppression and marginalization this community today ranks 97 out of all 97 ethnic groups in the country and so our program focuses on 10,500 girls like Kushbu from this community who are out of school. So about 70% of these girls, when they join our program, are not able to read a single letter or recognize a single digit. So imagine being 15 or 16 or 19 and not being able to write your own name, not being able to recognize your own name or never having sat in a classroom before. Therefore, our work with these girls since 2018 has been to provide them um, to provide them an opportunity to gain basic functional literacy and numeracy, and then to facilitate their transition into higher education or to um, livelihoods where they where we help them set up uh, their own small business enterprise. So we had been doing this quite successfully before COVID-19, and we were using something called teaching at the right level to make sure that girls uh, could rapidly acquire foundational literacy and numeracy and the results were also very good so about 20 percent of girls uh, were able to fluently read stories compared to just five percent of them when they joined the program similarly for numeracy 40 percent of the girls were able to recognize three digit numbers compared to just 11 percent um, when they began the program and in the picture you can see that one of our educators is using this approach um, to do an exercise called the number wheel which helps girls to understand the concept of place value and um, next slide please so last year when covid hit nepal as it did the rest of the countries in the world the government enforced a very strict lockdown in march 2020 so what this meant for our girls was that the schools were immediately shut our educators could not access the communities physically anymore and there were a lot of other existential challenges that the girls and the families were facing because uh, the Musahas work as bonded laborers, which is a modern form of slavery. And so this meant that the households were facing an immediate loss of income. When we did a rapid needs assessment that Manuel referred to earlier, we found that 65% of the families said that they were worried that they wouldn't have enough food um, to, to survive in a few months time. And so these girls were facing immense um, pressure. And, and, and so our teaching and learning approach needed to consider all of this very carefully. So we did another assessment, which showed that majority of these girls did not have access to mobile phones, did not have access to radio. So the um, 
so the more popular form of um, digital learning or online learning was incomprehensible for these girls. So what we did was we created a very bespoke distance teaching and learning program that was designed to help girls maintain their learning levels. So everything that they had learned before COVID, we wanted to really make sure that they could hold on to that. And so we used an approach that combined three things. So the first was phone sessions. So for girls that did not own a mobile phone, we made sure that they had access to mobile phones through either a family member, through a friend or through a neighbor, because these communities live in very small clusters. So even during a lockdown, they can still move around and, and girls were borrowing phones um, for a few minutes during the day to have sessions uh, with their educators through the phone. The second thing that we did was audio recorded sessions. So our community educators recorded instructions for girls to listen to and to work with on a weekly basis. And so these recordings were loaded onto a very basic USB device and dropped off to the villages on a weekly basis. We also provided the communities with Bluetooth speakers so the girls could use the uh, USB drive to connect to the speaker and to listen to the instructions. And the third thing that complemented this approach were uh, printed worksheets. So the printed worksheets were aligned to the um, audio instructions so the girls could listen to the instructions, understand concepts, and then use the worksheet to do these exercises. As you can see in the photo, that's one of our students um, using the speaker that has a USB device and she's doing her exercise on the worksheet. So this was done on a weekly basis and we also assessed the girls on a weekly basis. So our community educators, whenever possible, um, ideally once a week, would try and get to these communities, collect the exercises, and then um, do the assessment at home, call the girls, and then give them feedback over the phone. So this was uh, the approach that we used for this particular group of girls, considering the very low resource environment that they all live in. Um, and so, um, next slide, please. We found when we did an assessment at the end of the implementation with this particular group of girls last year that we had not only helped girls to maintain or preserve their learning levels but we had helped them to actually progress to higher levels of literacy and numeracy so as you can see in the graph when we began this intervention only eight percent of the girls were able to fluently read stories at the end of this 28 percent of girls were able to do that and similarly um girls, 75% of girls were able to do multiplication and 87% of girls were able to do division compared to just 17% and 4% respectively um, before um, we began this. So the data showed us that this was working with girls. We also spoke to girls and uh, tried to understand what this experience was like for them. And 65% of them uh, said to us that they actually preferred this way of learning to their traditional classrooms. And the reasons that the girls gave was that they really liked this new way of learning where they could use the USB device, they could use the speaker, speaker which they hadn't seen before. So all of this was very new for them and it excited them and it kept them engaged and that reflects positively on their learning levels. Uh, girls also said that they liked the fact that they could learn at any time. They were not restricted to particular class timings. Some girls also said that given that they had more domestic responsibilities in lockdown, they could do those domestic chores and listen to the audio sessions at the same time, which worked really well for them. There were also girls who said that they actually preferred learning in a classroom. And some of the reasons given were that girls said they really missed their friends, which is understandable. Um, they said that they missed one on one time with the teachers. And a very good point that the girls also made was that in a traditional classroom, you can ask questions immediately and, and ask for clarifications. And, and so that really allowed them to understand things quicker. Whereas uh, in a distance teaching and learning approach, there are probably fewer opportunities to do that. So we really listened to the girls. We also spoke to parents and our teachers for whom this was all new as well, and have really tried to refine this approach um, in the last year. Um, so two months ago, 
in April, Nepal ended a third lockdown and we are still in partial lockdown. And this was in direct response to the devastating second wave of COVID-19 and a direct impact of what happened in India because India and Nepal share an open border and communities like Kushbus, the Musahas, they live along the India-Nepal border. So we have since been working with about 2,000 girls using a more refined version of this approach where we have really taken in and reflected on the feedback given to us by the girls and um, based on what the data has showed us to try and deliver uh, an improved distance teaching and learning method. Um, and this time around, during this lockdown, it's not just food insecurity or protection risks for girls, but there is also a very high risk of uh, loss of life for, for girls and their families because of the Delta variant, which is which has been so devastating for these communities. And so the barriers to education these girls face today are higher than ever before, which means that our work with them is more critical than ever before. So in the next nine to 12 months, we are going to be working with 2,500 more girls like Kushbu who are aged 10 to 19 out of school to make sure that we give them, we provide them with a meaningful opportunity to learn. And we will do that through an approach that is effective, equitable, and responsive to the very unique needs of these girls because we truly believe that children need to have access to learning, even and especially in emergencies like these. Um, next slide, please. Um, so thank you so much for listening and thanks again for having me here today. If you would like to find out more about Street Child and how you can support our work, you can visit our website or get in touch with my wonderful colleague, Sarah, who leads our operations in Street Child Netherlands. Thank you. Usha, thank you so much. And it's wonderful the work that you're doing and the impact that you're making. So I hope you've inspired some of our audience today to take a look at Street Child and what you are doing. Um, I know there's a big team here in the Netherlands, but it's a really cross European uh, organization helping countries like Nepal and others to bring education to these girls and many more and giving them a safe place to, to live and to learn. So thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to continue now into the panel. If we move to the next slide, I, I want to introduce um, a bit of what we're going to talk about today, because it's a bit about the future of education and the impact of technology and what it is doing. Uh, we've all been impacted by it. I think all of us who have young children and neighbors um, have been impacted by this. And you see, if we go to the previous slide, uh, Paula, students across the place, how do we access the education, how teachers have been impacted, the technology is being used, and I think it's amazing how Usha just shared the USB sticks, the speakers, and being nice to be hosted here by Diane, who is driving technology platforms, uh, uh, with Manuel, who is bringing connectivity to homes, and having Georgie here driving uh, digital transformation across education. So with that, I want to dive into the first question that we have to our panel. Because you, speak, you see across Europe, um, countries have helped. They've allocated funds. They've driven national television to bring education. But I would like to ask our panelists, what do you see as the top three priorities needed to equalize education globally? So I want to open up the question first to Diane and then hand, hand it over to Georgie. So Diane, welcome to the panel. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa, and thank you so much for hosting me. Uh, it's really a pressure. And uh, Usha, it's an absolutely inspiring story that you're uh, you're telling. Thank you for that. So yeah, what are the top three priorities? Well, um, I would say it all starts with connectivity, right? Because I think the the COVID uh, um, uh, pandemic has shown us that um, digital education is here to stay. But what can we do without connectivity? And, and connectivity is also uninterrupted electricity. It's, of course, um, the Internet connectivity. And it has to do with, the, with uh, enabling or giving students access to devices. If you don't have those three elements, it's quite difficult to do some uh, digital education. Um, which is really uh, a solution to lots of this. So I, I definitely see a role of um, the government there. Currently, about 60% of the worldwide population is connected. 
that means that there are approximately 3.2 billion people that do not have connectivity yet. So if we really want to enable um, equality in education, uh, that's where the biggest task is right now to start with. Then a second big priority is to make it affordable and to really support equality through education. Every single child should have access to education. It's the only way to prosperity. It's the only way to save costs as an, as an economy. So to, to really identify that you want to have a knowledge economy, um, you have to support uh, the, the enablement of technology. And the thing is, with education technology, it starts, um, th the costs are very often in creating the technology. It's not so much in giving access to technology, but to, to build uh, a good platform, that's very expensive. So I, I also see that we can work together in that area to make it very affordable, that the edtech uh, companies don't have to charge high prices to get a return on their um, their um, their research and, and innovation, and then thirdly, uh, I think one of the biggest biggest challenges that we have to um, solve after connectivity is the shortage of teachers. So with digital education being there, um, we we know that we're going to have a massive shortage of teachers we are actually having a shortage of teachers right now but we have ain't have seen nothing yet of what's coming and the reason why is that many many jobs are changing because of a bigger role of technology throughout the world but also of different types of jobs um, we need to adapt and so currently there is already a lackage of uh, i think about a hundred or two hundred thousand teachers in the us only um, there are predictions of millions and millions of uh, teachers, shortage of teachers uh, by uh, 2030. And, uh, and, and, and finally, the, the expectation is, is that the biggest tech company of two, 2030 is going to be an online school. Of course, everybody sees the important role of the teacher. There's no doubt about it, but we need to be more creative in that. So I think those are the three biggest global challenges we have to fix and, and to prioritize to enable equality through education. Thanks, Diane. And so it's a great opening to Georgie now, because one of your key priorities was the role of government and, and funding. And for example, I saw the Netherlands is, is one country who allocated over two and a half million to support um, that the purchase of laptops. Now, doesn't go far, but it is something. But I think it's important to understand from your role at the European Commission, what do you see the role of government and what other priorities do you see are important? Thank you very much, Melissa, and uh, many thanks to the organizers of the uh, event. Uh, thank you, Manuel, as well, for setting the scene and uh, in particular to Usha for this very, very insightful and touching presentation. Um, I, for some reason, have also three priorities. Um, and um, they are indeed similar to uh, what Diane has mentioned, but perhaps from the public intervention point of view, um, I would categorize them uh, a little bit differently. So um, the first question is uh, one of um, access and um, access, um, which would uh, indeed uh, start from the connectivity in the infrastructure, so the telecoms, uh, they play basically, uh, in the meantime, a universal service role. Um, and we're not entirely there, even in the European Union, when it comes to, to, to the coverage. And um, uh, spreads through the question of equipment, which has been a huge problem. Uh, you mentioned the, the country of Netherlands, which is among the most advanced countries uh, in the European Union when it comes to digital readiness. And if you go further southeast, then you discover uh, 30, 40 percent, uh, basically, of uh, students who have not uh, not really appropriate equipment to access education. And of course, the further you expand the picture globally, the more of this you you see. So access is a condition sine qua non, as as uh, as it were. And this is a role of the government. Um, we believe in the European Union in universal uh, digital education which means that if uh, for um, if we would not have access physically to education, then we must guarantee access by whatever means there are 
and of course digital is the first uh, choice that comes to mind so first point is access and uh, this is why in this uh, digital decade that the european commission has uh, has called now the eu to to accelerate a little bit uh, our efforts uh, we believe that access is fundamental. By the way, the, very similar also to the question of health. But um, in addition to this, I mean, uh, this is what also we have uh, heard from our uh, consultations. We have seen last year when we ran the consultation through COVID that 40% of our respondents said that uh, insufficient in the, uh, infrastructure, either at school or at home, prevented them from having access to education. And um, um, very similar number also in terms of educators and education staff uh, said that this is basically the main disadvantage uh, when it comes to the effective implementation. Second point is um, a word which uh, uh, in a way is similar to the word equality, but without the E, and it's really a question of quality. So if we speak about equalizing um, education globally, then it must be a race to the top and not a race to the bottom, meaning that we have to make sure that we continue to innovate education and um, the purpose of, of um, uh, you know, why we educate people. So we have to be thinking carefully about what are the big problems that we have, and they are different in the different parts of the world. But um, the question of quality and quality assurance has to be on top of every um, public um, um, administration that uh, addresses seriously education for the future, for the digital age. And this is why we have to continuously innovate in things like uh, uh, online um, assessment, uh, online didactics, online pedagogy, because the world is turning uh, digital and uh, it has become actually quite digital, but education is now moving as well. Uh, and the final point is, um, is a question of literacy. So um, no matter how great the connectivity is or the teacher's skills are, if the pupils do not have uh, sufficient digital literacy, um, then it is very, very difficult to advance and to equalize education globally. So I salute here the efforts also of the street child organization. Um, if you look at Europe, um, we have today 56% of the population with um, uh, basic digital skills and the rest does not even have that. So the, the rest is, as you can tell, 44% of the population in Europe do not even have basic digital skills. This is 2021. Uh, and without those basic digital skills, of course, we cannot equalize uh, education. So these are my three takes. Thank you. Georgie, thanks. And I think you've given a bit of an answer to what I wanted to be one of my next questions was, what are some of the pros and cons of digital global education? And your last point was very clear. If the digital literacy doesn't exist, it's even harder for, um, somebody like Diane who is trying to drive a digital platform to, to reach everybody globally uh, uh, from an education perspective. And, and you touched on connectivity and you touched on equipment, both of you, and the importance of that to access, to equalize education. So this next question I'd really like to bring um, both to Diane and Manuel. And from a Diane perspective, what do you see as these pros and cons of digital global education, especially what you are working to achieve with WiseNose um, because that's exactly what you are trying to reach everyone globally to exactly what uh, Georgie said, to create that equalization. Um, yeah, and a potential blocker for you is that digital literacy. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So uh, I, I fully agree with the importance of, uh, of digital literacy. And, uh, and, and it actually all comes down to really, really reading, right? Uh, let if we have to choose and let go of anything else, just give them the access to 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 train them how to read because reading makes makes all the difference. And that's why I'm personally not the biggest supporter of going into a, a fully educational uh, educational system with videos only. I really, really am a big supporter of, of keeping uh, the the literacy skills very, very high. And, and but the beauty about um, giving students access to a digital uh, platform means that we are much more able to personalize results. Because uh, right now, when you, well, right, not right now, but in the traditional way, when you have to work with textbooks, 
all the children get one version that they have to learn. And for some students, that's way too easy. For some, it's way too difficult. So if we build technology that enables teachers to share much more personalized results with different reading levels, we can reach much more potential of, uh, of the students. And, and it all comes down to not treating them all the same and leaving the ones that need extra attention behind, but truly look at what equality means. And that means looking at the ones who need extra attention, but also looking at the very bright ones to stimulate them to reach and to, to, to shoot for the moon. So um, um, I would say one of the one of the big advantages is, is the way to personalize uh, the results. And then, um, of course, it also comes down to connectivity, right? There are rural areas where it is quite difficult to go to a physical building. And if the connectivity is there, that's, of course, a very important if. Um, education, it's reachable and, and uh, doable for all of us, uh, which makes it also, of course, very interesting. So there are lots of lots of uh, uh, pros. The cons, well, we just discussed, right? No connectivity, no digital education, which is really challenging. Yeah. Thanks, Diane. And, and that's why I want to hand it over now to Manuel, uh, because as a senior executive at Liberty, um, one of the foundations that you bring to this world is the ability to connect. So what do you see as some of the pros and cons of this digital global education? Thanks, Melissa. Um, the, uh, it was actually this this week, a very interesting article by, um, uh, in, in the economy about the future of schooling and what we've learned from the pandemic in, in the economist, you should, you should, I can highly recommend that. Um, what, what they wrote is that, Literally, you know, COVID-19 disrupted education on a scale never seen before, right? It's been kind of one massive worldwide kind of experiment almost. And by mid-April 2020, 90% of schools worldwide were closed. And, you know, people and uh, children and, 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 and educators were all kind of locked out of their classrooms. Um, and so digitization can help. Um, you know, certainly was partly helpful in, 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 in remedying that situation. Uh, although that, that helped only for, uh, on average, I think uh, the estimate was one quarter of the, of the world's uh, children had actually access to, uh, to remedial kind of a, a digital education during, during the pandemic, but it did inspire everybody to look at this a lot more closely. And I think that's that's the the, the big learning we, we've been taken away, um, and and it also has inspired a lot of uh, educators to look at schooling itself because let's not forget schooling and education um, are still quite kind of traditionally organised, uh, and it's not enough to just to bring in the, um, um, connectivity, just to bring in the broadband kind of connections. You actually need to look at the curriculum itself. Uh, there's another estimate which says that of all those online programs, most you know, of, of, the, of the professionals estimate that only half of those programs have actually become be effective, effective in, in getting the same level of kind of knowledge and, and understanding across uh, as, as what live teaching uh, managed to do. So there's, there's a lot to do both in the connectivity, digitization programs and in ev evolving the um, the education process and the, and the curriculum itself, and whether that's that software or whether that's um, the the mechanisms which you use to 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 talk with each other. I think even adults, such as ourselves, right? We are we are learning to to communicate and to to um, exchange knowledge ourselves this year a lot more using tools like the webinar we're on all on that today. That's something that wasn't so so common only only 18 20 months ago um and then of course there is you know definitely and 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 we're seeing that in the developed part of the world um there are digital innovations which are going to be you know making things a lot more attractive also for 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 teaching things like a virtual reality like augmented reality and 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 Georgie is right. I mean that is today is is the prerogative of 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 the very developed part of the world, 
very digitized countries, but you need those kind of kind of high end innovations in parts of the world to make sure that it later on spreads across the rest of the world. Uh, but we are, um, and and that's you know, Liberty does that on on, on its you know scale both through fixed and, and mobile connectivity we're trying to make that happen i think you saw that in the in the in the movie that usha showed that that even very simple and basic mobile technology can can help you know providing those connectivities in uh, in times of need um but i think personally that the the education um the digitization of the education could well, if we look back five years from now at, at what happened in this past these past 18 months, this could well have been the beginning of a, of a, of a wave of innovation and, and digitization, Melissa, uh, and, and evolution of the education system itself. Yeah, agree. And we hope that the equalization, um, let's say that gap closes. But if you look at the question we have in our, our uh, chat from Sylvia, um, I think, Diane, if you could help touch on it, but one of the next questions is what is that technology? How can we be more creative in also the remote communities that we are not creating this big difference between private and public? So I think Sylvia's question is even in probably a Western world from private and public, you, you see that gap increasing, but across the globe, what, what is the creativity that can be done to, let's say, limit the education gaps that we've seen grow over this last year? Yeah, well, it's it's very clear if you look at India, for instance, compared to uh, to to Europe. In Europe, every child, well, not every child, but lots of uh, students have access to at least a desktop or a tablet, but a bigger device to learn uh, their education. In India, the one and only device that really matters is the mobile phone. So the education technology companies have to adjust everything they do to be accessible through a mobile phone. And so that mobile phone is really going to to help a lot and and ideally speaking i would say it helps students if they have a bit of a bigger device but let's start with that little mo mobile phone and and even the, the cheapest ones can can really help us so um yeah the telcos really have a, a big role in, if you look at that connectivity that's step one really rural areas Step two is, of course, uh, uh, broadband access or, or connectivity to school buildings to enable at least a few devices into the school to have uh, access to that. So I'm going to ping it back first to Manuel, uh, because like you said, the biggest one on this is around that connectivity and, and bringing those mobile phones to those remote areas. Um, how do you see it, uh, Manuel, and what, what can be done more to achieve that? getting those mobile devices. Oh, you're still on mute. Sorry. Uh, there are quite a few programs already, uh, uh, Melissa, uh, uh, operated by a number of mobile companies and, and, and equipment providers actually to, to bring in kind of uh, older generation of, of equipment that's no longer in use uh, in the developed part of the world and to spread it out to, to, to the rest of the world. Uh, we've been engaged with that. Uh, a lot of our, our peers in the industry have been engaged with that. Uh, but we're also generally uh, trying kind of in our own uh, little way in the countries where we're, we're active today to, to develop that, that gap, hmm? to develop, so, so to, to help overcome that gap in, in, in education. Um, and we're doing that in a number of countries when it's um, in, in, in Poland, we, uh, we offer kind of free, you know, fiber optic internet for 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 teachers in uh, across the country. Um, in Belgium, we have set up a, a system to uh, uh, provide a you know, telnet essential internet solution, a basic internet package for vulnerable groups, so that even those vulnerable groups who do not have normal access, uh, and particularly those children, that they also have a kind of a sufficient internet connection at home. So we're trying to do various things, and, and obviously we're also working on those uh, kind of uh, exchanging those mobile devices to uh, to other parts of the world. Well, that's great, Manuel. Keep it up and keep inspiring the other, uh, let's say, mobile providers because I know it's a close close network, and you know a lot. Uh, so keep inspiring them to make that impact because I think Usha, um, you shared in your speech some of the creative things that are happening, but what else would you like to still see happening in the future? And, and how can we in the Western world help continue to make an impact in these hard to reach countries? 
Thank you, Melissa. So, um, I think I would re-emphasize what uh, the point that I think Diane and Manuel both made. So, firstly, I think um, what Diane was saying about not just uh, about firstly the importance of reading and then just how life changing that can be for for most of the students who are under reach and who remain under reach. So, so that's definitely one of the focuses um, for us as well. So that's something to keep in mind. And the other thing Diane also said was. Um, was was that we have to be more equitable in our approach so not just focusing on children who are already doing better and, and you know just trying to push them forward but a classroom has lots of different types of students who learn in different ways and so any um technology that that uh, is used in distance teaching and learning or remote teaching and learning has to also keep that in in mind and i think um our approach that I briefly touched upon earlier, teaching at the right level, was doing that in physical classrooms where the learning is based on the current learning levels of students. So children are grouped um, together according to their learning levels, not by age, not by grade, but by their current learning levels. And we have very rigorous tests that we do to to be able to determine that. And so the learning happens for these uh, group of children in those groups. And, and so it helps them to learn together and at the level that is required for that group. So I think that equity is, is hugely important and has to be reflected in all forms of learning, including digital learning. Um, and um, yeah, so, so, so for us, this has of course been very, um, very important in our approach as well as we continue to do distance teaching and learning and we've always tried to make sure that that approach is as um, as equitable as, as possible. And um, so, yeah, so in terms of what um, you know, Manuel was also alluding to, I think it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's really critical for for all um, um, uh, education providers to also uh, really um, make sure that what they're doing is effective, right? So it's not about having technology for the sake of having technology. It's what works for a particular group of, of learners. And if it is through mobile phones and they have access to mobile phones, then that's great. But if they are learning better through um, a worksheet system or through the audio recording sessions for, that we were doing, that is very basic, then that's also fine because ultimately what we are trying to do is to help them gain literacy and numeracy. So I think um, it's not about uh, taking a cookie cutter approach and assuming that what works in one place works in another and, and just going with a wave of uh, just digitizing everything. It's about what works and what is effective. So I would like to probably see see more of both of those those things. Oh, thanks. And uh, I, I hope that what's happening to us through this pandemic and all the digitalization is hopefully reaching more children across the globe. And um, it's great to see how you're driving the continuation. Um, what stuck on me is the digital literacy and how do we we continue because I'm going to skip around a bit and my next question goes to Georgie um, because I think the big question we all have is is remote home learning here to stay so and if it is you know I think everybody looks from a flexibility family lifestyle what's happened to us but is this temporary or do you think it's here to stay Georgie Thank you. Um, uh, the short answer is yes, uh, it is here to stay. And then uh, I would like to differentiate a little bit, of course, and categorize a, a part of it. Um, so when we run uh, our uh, open public consultation leading to the Digital Education Action Plan, which is the policy agenda of the European Union for, for the programming period of the next years in digital education, which we adopted last year, uh, we saw that 95% of respondents uh, uh, said that um, um, this crisis is a turning point for the use of digital technology in education. And um, uh, digital education is not new. It's been around for 20, 30 years. So, um, however, another piece of uh, statistics which was striking was that 60% uh, of educators said that they, and we're talking about the European Union still only, have said that they have encountered distance and online learning for the very first time. And this is uh, probably even a biased group because they are tending to listen to this type of surveys. So we have to imagine that the shock and the disruption are very, very big. Um, but um, the societal trends uh, towards remote working, I mean, um, remote working has worked rather well. 
while online and distance learning was much more of a hit and miss story in the European Union, depending on where you look at. So um, my answer is nevertheless yes, because if you look at first higher education, then the trend is very clear. We are not going to see any more the one-on-one type of uh, what the United States call one-on-one lectures, which are basically the introduction in um, mathematics with uh, 300 people in the Audi Max. This is gone and it's a good thing that it's gone because uh, this is much more efficient and effective if you do it um, digitally. Um, it's more comfortable, it's better for the, for the um, uh, world, for the climate. Uh, and uh, we don't really need one person to talk to 300 uh, live while they can do it just like here. Um, all universities virtually in the European Union have embraced uh, online and uh, the journey goes to the hybrid mode. It is better for the student, it is better for flexibility, it is better for young parents. When you go to secondary education, um, um, we have a very interesting statistics from Estonia uh, of last year. Estonia is a pioneer when it comes to the digital um, sector in the European Union. And interestingly there, uh, the secondary, um, um, a survey in the, in the secondary of, uh, education said that 40% of students would actually like to keep this way going forward um, with the hybrid mode. 40% said that they are so-so about it and 20% were like, no, we want to really go back to physical only. So even four out of 10 is a very significant number to ignore. Um, so the trends are also clear. And to finish this off, um, if you look at primary education, this is where I believe on the contrary, we are going to see uh, a continuation of uh, really physical engaged learning because primary education uh, fulfills a much more um, also socialization type of uh, function. It is, close, it is close to early childhood education and care. It is very linked to social policy. It is linked to anti-discrimination policies. It is linked to empowering women to be, uh, you know, on the same par together with, uh, with males in the workforce. And so there are a lot of factors, not only pedagogical, uh, but the most important factors are actually pedagogical. Why I think that, the, that when it comes to primary, we will see a continuation of what we have. Um, and this is, this is uh, our kind of um, expectation for what comes. Thank you. Sure. Georgie, thanks for that. And also the stats are very insightful on how people are thinking today, which is driving, like you said, the, the future trend. But I'm curious to know, Diane, do you agree with Georgie and do you see other, uh, let's say, uh, let's say trend or what is your view with regards to the future with regards to remote home learning? Is it here to stay and grow? Yeah, no, I, I fully agree uh, with the, Dimitri, absolutely. And and also on the part, Georgie, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think that happens more with your last name and first name. I'm sorry, Georgie. <laughs> um, um, I fully agree with that. And also on the fact that uh, primary education is really, really important to, to, to have the children and have a face-to-face um, uh, environment, uh, the social economics are super important uh, for that and, and the social well-being uh, for, for it. Um, I'm also um, aligned that I think it's a good thing that higher education is going to be more accessible and the prices are going to go down because right now very often it was for the, the rich and, and, and the few of us and which is really not something that we would like to, to see. And um, again, in the, uh, the the middle group, the middle and secondary education, the balance and to have um, um, a, a combined uh, a model, a hybrid model, is absolutely the way uh, the way to go. If you ask me, where we reach much much more students um, and give them a better education because we can personalize the results. So yeah, yeah. fully aligned. Go oh, great. I am. I realize we're coming to the end of this webinar. We had just a, a one hour short lunch webinar and our goal was to bring some new insights and, and thoughts and most importantly for everyone to see the impact um, that you potentially can make uh, not only with an organization like Street Child and I also see we have attendees here also working to reach remote locations. Um, I do have a question to the audience. If anyone has any additional questions, hopefully Sylvia, we've answered your question earlier on. Um, does anyone have any questions for the last couple minutes here in this webinar? 
We have a couple of questions that have come in, Melissa. Um, first one, what are the key elements that an online learning resource such as Weasnose must have in order to be successful, especially developing countries? Yeah. Well, the answer I can be short about it. We have to think global, but act locally. So um, there are huge cultural differences. So we can, we, um, the, the whole uh, thought is that we can offer a platform that's really affordable and um, accessible for the, for the whole globe. But we have to look at cultural differences and heritages around uh, uh, languages uh, uh, around, that are very, very local. So it's a combination, global and local, to answer a very short question. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. Um, we may have time for one more. Are there any steps already to solve the problems of connectivity on educating people with no digital skills in the EU? Are there any deadlines? And if there are, are they realistic? On the first question, on the uh, are there any uh, steps? Yes, the EU has presented just um, six months ago an unprecedented uh, package, which we call uh, Recovery and Resilience um, Facility, which is twice the size of the annual revenue of the Netherlands. So it's it's quite a substantial uh, package of uh, money, and 20% uh, of it will go to digitalization. So there will be a lot of investment into infrastructure, connectivity, but also digital education. Second part of your question, uh, Thanos, uh, on the digital skills. Um, yes, there are a lot of different initiatives at EU level, but I just want to qualify here that the responsibility of the member states are to uh, cover their um, national education and training systems. So in a way, um, uh, this is the subsidiarity and they are responsible for building those types of skills. We do have targets, um, but um, uh, I do hope that they are realistic. For us, they are, uh, but we work very closely with the member states so that they step up their efforts. And I think the moment is good now to, to push for more of this. Thanks, Georgie. Um, I realize we're at the hour. If we could just bring up all of the last slide, because I would really like to thank all of our panelists. And again, especially Usha coming and sharing the personal stories and the impact that you are making in Nepal. Um, I wanted to share the names and if anyone is interested to contact any of our speakers, you can find them on LinkedIn. And also, if you want to scan the QR code, understand more of the impact that you can make with Street Child. Uh, Sarah is one of our key contacts. Um, uh, Sarah Fenekata, she's here in the Netherlands and uh, one of our key leads who supports Street Child here in the Netherlands. So thank you, Georgie, Diane, Usha, Manuel, for your time and effort and the whole team that helped put this together. Let's make education equal. Let's keep working on it. So thank you very much for your time today. I wish you all a great day and thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you, Melissa. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.